I guess Kartika, we could launch our uh, poll and our screen for while we wait. Okay, it's launched. While we wait for the others to trickle in, please feel free to tell us what you thought, what you think uh, on the poll. And we also have one question we're curious about. What is the one common application of AI you recently came across? So if you have an answer to that, please type it within the chat. We'd love to hear what people have been dabbling with. Reminding everyone that there is a poll. So folks who've just joined us, welcome. We'll just give it another minute before we start off. And if anybody has played with an AI application, please do let us know in the chat. We're just curious to see how much AI has come into your lives already. Is everyone able to see the poll? I see that it says zero people have participated. Is this because but I have logged in from the same account, Carmen? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, would you yeah. want to try launching uh, it from your end? It looks like they're answering Kartika. There's 15 out of 18 people who. Okay, I can see zero. So that's. Yeah. <laughs> we have 14 people who say it's absolutely important to know how and by whom these systems are being designed. So, um, yeah. And we do have somebody, one person saying that it feels like a black box and I'm not sure how to make sense of it yet. So thank you for that. Thanks for sharing and thanks for adding to this. Um, and with that, we will start today's session. So welcome and thank you for all of you who are here to attend our future fantastic dialogue behind AI systems. So just to give everybody a little bit of context about these dialogues, um, this dialogue is part of a year long program that we are running um, in collaboration, Be Fantastic in collaboration with Future Everything. And we have Future Everything's creative director, Irini here with us as well. Um, the, this is supported by the British Council under the India UK together season of culture grants that they are running through this year. And we also have support from the Pro Helvetia Swiss Arts Council and the Goethe Institute. And a big shout out to our supporting partners, Jaga and Dara as well. Um, Quickly, for those of you who are new to us, and I do see a lot of old faces in here, so thanks for coming in. Uh, Be Fantastic is a tech art platform. My name is Kamya. Apologies for the late introduction. My name is Kamya and I run Be Fantastic. We started off in Bangalore uh, in 2017, but we have quite a kind of an earlier history with Jaga, that was founded in 2009, bringing art and technology communities together to really have fun and innovate and find new mediums of expression, most often addressing some kind of societal issue. And um, 
with those keywords, I think we're very aligned with Future Everything from Manchester. And Irini, I'll hand it over to you to introduce yourself and Future Everything. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, Kamiya, and welcome everyone. And um, it's great to, uh, to have another dialogue as part of the program. So uh, Future Everything uh, is a non-profit arts organization based in Manchester. And uh, some of you might remember it uh, since the uh, mid 90s uh, for being a festival, an annual festival in Manchester. But uh, recently we've moved to year round activity and our work focuses on ideas to do with art, uh, technology, but also society and exploring uh, uh, yeah, current issues and, and challenges and, uh, and also uh, trying to understand how art and culture might, um, yeah, is why art and culture is, is relevant to society across different sectors and also uh, what are what is their role. And uh, I'm looking forward to today's conversation uh, with Erinma and uh, Urvasi. And uh, yeah, it's, it's brilliant to have you both here. And I'll pass it back over to you, Kamia. Oh, okay. Uh <laughs> And oh, sorry. Do you? I can. I can just. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Tell everybody okay. about Future Fantastic. Great. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, as Kamia said uh, earlier, uh, Future Fantastic is a program that is supported by the British Council and many other people, and it's a, uh, it's a, a very exciting collaboration. And um, the uh, the culmination of the program will be a festival that uh, explores uh, AI, but also climate crisis, and will take place in. Uh, Bangalore in March next year and the festival is going to showcase a series of uh, artistic commissions that came out of the fellowship program but also like um, other commissioning programs and uh, and we have a great group of artists from uh, India, UK, Germany but also other countries uh, who have joined us and uh, for this program and yeah and we hope to see some of you there, but there will be also uh, some uh, part of the activity online. So yeah, for people who can join us. Thank you. And I hand it over to Kartika, but to just say to everybody assembled here today, please stay in touch with us. You, we now have your emails. We'll put you on a group that helps you stay in touch with more such dialogues, but also, um, things that are going to happen in the festival itself. And so Kartika, if you can introduce the speakers and take it away. Yeah. So we'd like to introduce our speakers for the session. Today, we are joined by Dr. Urvashi Aneja from India and Dr. Erinma Ochu from the UK. Dr. Urvashi Aneja is the founding director of Digital Futures Lab, a multidisciplinary research network that examines the complex interactions between technology and society in the global South. Her current work examines the ethics and governance of AI in the global South, digital public infrastructure, platforms for public service delivery, labor rights, and well-being. Urvashi has a PhD from the Department of Political Science and International Affairs, University of Oxford, UK. Dr. Erinma Ochu is a storyteller and neuroscientist developing extended reality agenda, post-carbon futures within the Digital Cultures Research Center at UWE Bristol. They lead on immersive storytelling for climate justice initiative engaging environments and the AI and arts practice element of patterns in practice. A study examining practitioner values, beliefs and cultures of machine learning in drug discovery, higher education and arts practice. As co-director of Squirrel Nation with artist, researcher and designer Carolyn Ward, they make art that considers coexistence as an epic. Thank you so much Urvashi and Erinma for joining us today. We would now like to hand it over to Urvashi. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. Delighted to be able to talk to all of you and, and be in this kind of setting. And uh, I really hope this can lead to more future conversations and uh, more collaboration between all of us as well. Um, so maybe what I will do is I will share my screen. Just give me one second. Um, Sorry, can you see my screen? 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Cool. I don't know why it's not going into presentation mode, but hopefully it's still clear enough. Yeah, all good. Okay. Cool. Super. So um, I'm I'm gonna talk to you for the next 10, 12 minutes. Uh, and I'm going to try and be perhaps deliberately pr provocative in my remarks. Uh, maybe it's not provocative enough. That will depend on the audience we have on this call today. Um, so like Kartika said, my name is Urbishi Aneja, and I run a research collective based out of Goa called the Digital Futures Lab. Um, and we study the social impacts of technology transitions. Um, and a lot of our work recently has been trying to understand, in some sense, exactly the topic for for of, of this talk which is what are the kind of material conditions um, and systems that undergrade the production of emerging technologies and how do we take a more uh, upstream approach to building more responsible technology to doing more responsible innovation so typically one often has a, a or, or there's a lot of emphasis on kind of legal approaches to addressing technological harms but we want to kind of step away from those legal approaches and ask what else can we do more upstream um, to address uh, technology and to steer technology more most, most importantly, uh, towards beneficial social outcomes. Um, and our thinking on this is that technology is not merely a tool. Uh, technology is not something that's neutral. Technology is not a tool. Technology is something that is socially constructed. Uh, and the development and production and use of technology also reproduces social relations. So that's the kind of uh, starting point from which uh, we approach our work. Um, so. What I'm going to talk to you today about when I when I think about what lies behind AI systems, uh, I'd like to propose to you that the production of kind of contemporary AI systems is predicated on unfettered resource extraction, labor exploitation, and market monopolization. Um, and what I will do is talk about these various layers of what's behind AI systems, starting from the very material aspects of kind of resources and labor, and then zooming out towards talking about the logic of innovation and talking about different types of intelligence. Um, and, and then a few remarks to conclude with. Uh, but the one thing I should say, and, and sorry, that's a mistake in my slide, is that when I am talking about AI for the purpose of this presentation, I am talking about machine learning, which is the dominant form of AI. And towards the end of my talk, I will um, open up the op open up that conversation for us to think about what could be non-machine learning forms of AI. So I don't think machine learning and AI are synonymous, but just to be clear, I'm talking about AI, um, I'm talking about machine learning. Um, so Karthik, I'll just request you if you could just keep time and just give me a heads up when I'm... Um, sure, we'll do. Yeah, yeah uh, running over or close to. So since since many of you who are part of this fellowship um, and the provocation for the fellowship was also to think about how we can build awareness and build a dialogue around climate justice issues and climate issues more broadly and the role of technology in that, I thought I would start with the issue of climate. Um, and there is a um, there is a discourse around how technology can be used and AI can be used to address. Uh, some of the harmful, some of the harmful kind of climatic outcomes that we see of of modernization, um, and I'd like to suggest to you or or provoke the thought that that might not be the case. Um, so just a few kind of simple simple thoughts to help ground that, right? So just the training of a single AI model emits a huge amount of carbon dioxide. Uh, it's not a little amount of carbon dioxide, it's a huge amount. It's equivalent to uh, comparable to five cars over their lifetime. And I think what's even more interesting is that recent studies show that to get from kind of like 70% accuracy of a machine learning model to get to that 99% accuracy, then consumes two three hundred percent the times of energy consumed in the zero to 80 stage and the zero to 70 stage the hugely energy in intensive and huge emitters um and i think it's not it's not we have to we can't just think about technology and ai as this kind of product that is producing these impacts or this kind of technology that is producing these impacts i think we have to link it very very closely to um to the kind of business model and to the logic of an extractive data economy um where um 
I mean, it's the, it's a combination of the kind of market monopolization of big tech, the combination of the concentration of market power that has led to this excessive data processing and storage, the complex data and uh, analytics, etc. Um, and so the the scale and nature of kind of data waste today is not necessary, nor is it inevitable. It is very much tied to the business models of our current digital economy. Um, and the last point that I want to leave you with on, on the climate issue is that I would even suggest that the over-reliance of new technology to solve climate issues um, is in fact enabling some kind of, is enabling a delay in addressing many of these problems. Um, so the, the te technological promises have raised expectations of more effective policy options becoming available in the future. Um, and this, I think, is, has, um, has permitted a kind of continued politics of risk and precarity. And even if, even if that, the, that kind of politics of risk and precarity is not intentional, uh, it results in kind of passing off risk to the most vulnerable, right? So when we're thinking about AI and climate, I think it's really important that we don't think of it as this kind of one-way relationship and really understand how resource extractive the building production of AI systems is uh, and what that means uh, for, for the earth, for, uh, for climate um, more generally. Uh, and I think this becomes particularly important as we see AI kind of enter every field of our or every domain of our life uh, in very critical social areas such as health uh, and even in other domains of life such as film and so on and so forth. Um, the second, the second kind of layer that we need to look at when we're thinking about what lies behind AI production is the labor question. So behind kind of all high tech, shiny AI systems, there is a global supply chain of technology production that is typically marked by fairly exploitative relation, relationships. So just to give you an example, so ImageNet, uh, which some of you might be familiar with, uh, which has become like the de facto benchmark for image recognition algorithms. Um, so it was built on outs on on outsourcing the work of labeling millions and millions of images uh, via Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a gig work, digital gig work platform to workers around the world. Um, so for an example, crowdsource platforms from Venezuela and Brazil and Italy are crucial for what we for what seems like a high-tech innovation like self-driving cars, right? But these workers are typically very, very far removed from the products of their labor. Um, the extraction, the concentration of value really lies with those companies, not with the labor. Labor is typically paid very little. In some cases, they're actually not paid at all because it's seen as a kind of digital skilling program, right, rather than actual work. Um, and so there's a lot of unpaid and exploitative labor that goes into the production of these systems. Um, and this human labor is there at every stage of the building of AI systems, from data collection to data labeling to data processing to the testing to the training, so on and so forth. Um, so even something as as so in in the Indian context, we had recently done a study on looking at the uh, at AI's uh, AI intervention in the healthcare space, and what we found was that despite these kind of narratives of India being a data rich country and data empowerment, so on and so forth, um, there's actually very little usable public Public, sec public health data. And so most companies had to collect data from scratch on the ground. And they use community health workers or ASHA workers to collect this data. Uh, community health workers are typically the, they're the ones who are very, very close to the community. They have a um, they have a, a fairly kind of mature understanding of what is happening in that space, but they are extremely overburdened already with their work. Um, and so this becomes a kind of additional labor that they have to do. No one is compensating them for this labor. And over a period of time, the knowledge that these ladies, these women have of these local health systems risks being transformed or risks being displaced as they become kind of mere data collectors, right? So we need to look at not just... Um, uh, so we need to look at how, what impact it has on the labor that is entailed in the production of AI, not just in terms of jobs, which is often the, like the big headline stuff, but also in terms of kind of work processes, in terms of wages, in terms of what counts as a decent living, so on and so forth. 
Um, and finally, I, I think on the on the labor question, it's also worth highlighting that the promise of AI in many senses is yet to be realized. Like those kind of breakthroughs in medicine or in addressing climate crises is yet to be realized. There are kind of few examples, a few pilots on the margins, but that that whole scale kind of transformative impact is yet to be realized. Um, and in some sense, it remains a future imaginary. But what is very real is the very is the is the harms to workers already. Um, so gig workers are, are the prime example of this disconnect between the imagination of AI as this future emancipatory transformative force and the very, very real harmful, ongoing harmful effects of uh, AI systems with very little recourse to, um, to any form of, of harm redressal. Um, so moving on from there, so we have the, oh, sorry, I was just in the chat yeah uh, so moving on from there so we have the, the the resource layer then you have a labor layer and then there's another layer on top which i would call the innovation logic um and here and and bear with me if this sounds slightly um i don't know obtuse but here i would argue that the kind of logic that we the the um the production of AI is predicated on market monopolization, is predica the, uh, predicated on asymmetric power relations. So uh, it is the growth of big tech companies, it is the kind of surveillance economy model that has contributed to the growth of AI. Uh, and, and again, like, like I'm saying, machine learning is what I mean when I say AI. So machine learning is itself not new. What is new is that we have this amount of data available. Um, and so I I would argue that what we're seeing today is a form of rentier innovation, uh, where the innovation that's happening is about transforming human life and personal assets and, and, and personal experiences into assets, and then finding ways to extract value through the ownership and control and exchange of that asset. So innovation, rather than becoming about the production of something new, right, is instead about the extraction, is about the uh, a commodification of of behavior of behavior and experience and converting that into an asset and in that sense it, it, it we can call it a form of rentier innovation um and then finally to zoom out even one level further um so we've talked about climate the labor the innovation logic or the business logic and then one level further and what is the kind of intelligence that gets embedded or that is assumed when we talk about artificial intelligence so there's obviously a, you know the, there is a there is a long history of of the of data science uh, which is embedded in in colonial logics and the modern form of data science that we see is embedded in values which sees individuals as autonomous as rational, as reasonable, um, and, and is embedded in values of enlightenment and individualism. And it sees individuals as divorced from their social context and in the pursuit of the kind of maximization of their social interest, of their interests. So it's really important that we don't forget that even when we're building intelligence, there's different types of intelligence and there's certain kinds of intelligence we are privileging and there's certain kinds of intelligence that we're inevitably sometimes or unconsciously baking in to our technological products. And if technology becomes in some sense, some kind of invisible arbiter or invisible negotiator of our times, then that, that is the form of intelligence that we are reproducing. So we need to also kind of push back at a more foundational level uh, and to think about really what it means to be human. What is that intelligence that we're trying to reproduce? When we say artificial intelligence, what are the values that we want to take forward? Um, and I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to kind of romanticize Asian traditions or African traditions, and that's not the point I'm making here, but just as an illustrative example, there are different versions or different understandings of what me of the human in different traditions. So in the African tradition of Ubuntu, for an example, there's a very strong understanding of, of, of interconnectedness. Uh, in the Kampong tradition in the, in the East Asian context, there's a strong tra tradition of solidarity. Um, and that these, these, these uh, ideas of solidarity and interconnectedness is what makes us human. Um, in other African traditions, there is a strong tradition of prioritizing nature over man. So once you start beginning to bring in these kind of other ethical traditions into how we think about AI, it becomes quite obvious that the current kind of paradigm 
paradigm of, of the machine learning model that we have today is extractive, is um, is extractive of resources, of labor, and is fundamentally unsustainable. Um, and so that's not to say that one is against technology or that one is um, uh, a naysayer in some sense. I don't want to use a Luddite phrase because I think that gets misused very often. Um, but it's to say that we need to push harder and to think about what it is that we want this artificial intelligence to really look like and really mean if it's going to be emancipatory. In its current form, um, it, there are limits to how, how emancipatory it can be. Um, and so just finally, like what, what, you know, what does this mean and where do we go from here? So I think there's, there are limits to a kind of emancipatory progressive machine learning based future, which is predicated on achieving scale on efficiency. And essentially what machine learning does is crunch things down to mean, to mean values. By definition, it leaves out the outliers and that's not the kind of democracy in the world that we wanna live in. Um, and then how do we embed kind of ethics of care into innovation process? Right? How do we how do we do technological innovation that is attentive to people's needs in context specific ways, rather than being extractive is regenerative, and that protects people despite their capacities, not because of their capacities. Just to give you an example of what I mean there, so current data protection regulation, for an example, is based is premised on the idea of individual consent, and so it's premised again on the idea. Oh, it 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 assumes or people are protected because of their capacities in current data protection models, not despite their capacities. And I think finally a question for all of you and um, the fellowship of course, is that, you know, what, what is the role of the artist in all of this and how does, you know, how does one think about cultural production uh, in this context? And I guess it's that age old saying of, you know, can you break the master's house with the master's tools or do we need a, a different set of tools? Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and I hope that provided some food for thought and um, yeah, and of course, happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Urvashi. Um, everyone, please leave your questions in the chat. We'd be happy to get to them during the Q&A at the end. Um, we'd like to invite Arunma now to make a presentation. Well, thank you so much, and uh, I really enjoyed um, the start to the conversation from Urashi. Um, I hope I can build on what's been uh, said already. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. One second. Okay, hopefully you can you can see my screen. Yes. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, so um, thank you very much to the Be Fantastic team for the very kind invitation to speak today, um, specifically for curating um, um, and, and organizing a series of really excellent dialogues. Um, um, I know how much time that takes and, and craft and intelligence, so I'm grateful for that. So to, to today's dialogue on tech, art and society behind AI systems, um, I hope to offer a series of provocations around the culture in which artificial intelligence is developing in order to generate a conversation that can engage with more perspectives and of course your questions and your practices. Um, so for brevity, I've kind of called my contribution um, AI cultures. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Marima Ochu. I'm an associate professor in immersive media at University of West England, Bristol, and I'm based in the Digital Cultures Research Centre. I've only just joined um, in September, and so much of what I'm going to talk about, it comes from kind of three inputs that I'd like to acknowledge. One is, is my arts practice as co-founder of Squirrel Nation with artist and designer Caroline Ward. We had a racial justice fellowship um, with the Ada Lovelace Institute and LSE, London, London School of Economics, um, and then a research project that I've, that I've been working on with um, Dr. Joe Bates at the University of Sheffield, which is focused on um, practitioner values, beliefs and cultures in machine learning. Um, and then maybe just one like dip, dipping into a sort of planetary agenda 
that arose out of um, the work that I was doing on the Ada Lovelace um, Fellowship um, and Inventing Futures Otherwise. Um, to offer a description, I'm a brown screen person with peppercorn hair drawn back into a bun. I'm wearing black rim, I think that yes, black rim glasses and a grey t-shirt. Um, my background is blurred, I think, but I'm sitting in my rented flat in Hackney in London in England. And on the screen, you'll see an image of a midnight flower, which is from one of my artworks with Caroline called Nature's Switch, which considers what a plant knows. So think about plant intelligence in relation to sensing light outside of the human register. Um, so this sits underneath the title of the talk, AI Culture, and a reminder if you want them to switch on the captions using the CC button. Um, so, so perhaps um, a really obvious place to start from the kind of Western context in which I'm situated is to consider tech art and society um, within a system in which imagined visions of living with machines reaches a mainstream society. And Hollywood black blockbuster movies are a good example of that. So just Googling a few, these are some of the ones that rise to the top uh, using the, the algorithms of, of Google search. Um, and you know, if you were to think about uh, AI films like AI, these are just posters of those films. AI Minority Report with Tom Cruise doing his his swiping, um, and her um, at the very best, they do their very best, I should say, to uphold representations of which lives matter, who gets to perform on screen, of course, who gets paid, and um, all of this is consumed by the public imagination, eating um, popcorn and, and Coca Cola. And perhaps even more so now, you know, than um, streaming via Netflix into our homes. Um, so perhaps a simplistic critical analysis of Spike Jones's Her, in which an operating system within a smartphone acts as a support network, comes as no feminist surprise that $23 million is invested in a movie that has the voice of the support system as a cisgendered white woman, which allows the lead, who's pictured here with the moustache and the green eyes and his white skin, um, Joaquin Phoenix to take center stage as he emotion he's emotionally supported by the operating system after a relationship breakup and you know no surprise he gets very attached um, to this voice um, and the interaction between the imagining of living with machines and their presence in society kind of works in two directions um, so with Minority Report some of the technologies that were developed in that film or you know put on screen in that film are now becoming part of reality and our everyday reality. Um, if we were to look at other films like The Terminator, iRobot and The Matrix, um, you know, Elon Musk's unveiling of his Tesla robot the other day, it looks remarkably similar to the robot in the Terminator movies. Um, and perhaps an underlying concern, many of these movies from Terminator, iRobot and The Matrix onwards is that the technology is outpacing the people who create and operate it. We're losing control. The creators are losing control of the technology as if AI is somehow beyond our human control. And of course that's um, rubbish. Um, this of course paints a dystopian vision of living with machines and hides the reality that a version of AI machine learning is pervasive across most facets of our lives now. So there's a disconnect between reality and the future. And Avash you know, touched on this. And so we need this critical discussion with technologists developing AI and the cultures in which they're developing them, their beliefs and the, the values behind them as to how we got to a reality in which automated decision making affects much of our lives, often without our knowledge of it. Um, and of course, there is a long history of human imagination creating artificial and automated liveliness. So from um, Muslim um, polymath Al Jazari on the left, automated design, designs of an automated musical robot um, that has automated musicians whose facial expressions change as they um, play music to, in this case, um, floating on a lake and entertaining guests at royal drinking parties. And, um, you know, we can look back to the um, creation of intelligent beings in Greek ancient myths. Um, you know, various poets have thought about this and, 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 and imagined um, intelligent beings uh, to protect um, particular aspects of their society. And then this um, automated digesting duck by a Grenoble artist, Jacques de Bourcanson. 
Um, and Ada Lovelace imagined in 1842 that the analytical engine that she was working on might act on, on things besides numbers and be applied to the science of musical composition. And of course, today artists are still considering life with machines. This installation from conceptual artist Annika Yee at the Turbine Hall, um, the Tate in London, which was, um, I think this was 2021, I, I saw it. Um, and she wondered as a, as a conceptual artist, what it would feel like to share the world with machines that live in the wild and evolve on their own. So we're offered um, different visions of, of, of these futures and different trajectories perhaps. Um, so the original vision of AI about auto, was about the automation of cognition, um, but now with that comes the automation of culture. And, and we have to think about, you know, how does it happen that we get from considerations of the automation of cognition and thinking to the automation of culture. How, how does that happen? Um, and you know, these, these are the founding fathers, so-called founding, founding fathers of art AI and, and that with their Dartmouth conference over a summer, they all kind of came together and to think about um, one particular proposal of how to find out how to make machines, use language, form extractions and concepts, solve all kinds of problems now reserved from humans and improve themselves. And this, this image, which is, from that proposal is this two month study of artificial intelligence that they wanted to carry out um, to start thinking about that. But of course you can think about who was invited um, to that meeting and the kind of culture, if you imagine what universities were perhaps like in the sixties, um, who was invited to that table and who wasn't. So AI like all technologies is shaping how culture and life is organized. And the technologies are also shaped by the cultures in which they were imagined. Um, one of the challenges with the Dartmouth um, study was that their work was co-opted by the US government who liked the idea of intelligence, particularly in relation to surveillance. And in some ways, um, the rest is kind of history. Um, what happens in the West often gets transmitted um, globally around the world and um, is animated in particular um, ways of thinking and doing um, in relation to culture. And of course, you know, coming from this British context, our, our kind of father of cultural studies, um, Stuart Hall, um, this quote that I've worked with quite a lot is, you know, saying culture comes into play at precisely the point where biological individuals become subjects and what, and that what lies between the two is not some automatically constituted natural process of socialization, but a much more complex process of formation. And of course, Stuart Hall's not talking about artificial intelligence. Um, and so it's really important that um, with this quote that we're mindful of, of thinking about the cultures, the people, the values, the beliefs behind the development of, of these AI systems and who benefits and who doesn't. Um, so Lev Manovic says in one sense, AI is now everywhere. It's, it plays a crucial role in the global cultural ecosystem. It recommends what we should see, listen to, read and buy. It determines how many people will see our shared content and who gets to see it. It helps us to now make aesthetic decisions. There are you know, thousands of intelligent but not very glamorous operations that work in phones, computers, web servers, and other parts of the IT um, universe. But what Lev kind of skips out, Ivashi picked up on, which is thinking about the labor and the people behind um, making all of this stuff work. So um, whether we arrive at machines having an understanding of the human world, which is kind of what a lot of um, these visions of the future are, are, are looking towards and thinking about cultural AI. There's a kind of vision of it where algorithms are perhaps used to create art, create music, but that they don't understand the human world and human meanings. Um, does it matter? And I, you know, this is something we can talk about, um, or is it a distraction to think about the kind of futures we actually want. So, you know, focusing very much on the human, the human centered intelligence perspective, is that a distraction from considering the future or is it something that holds us in this um, present and the history of the past that we already have heard about? Um, so I think it's really important to also pick up on, and I refer a lot to American um, scholars um, to some extent, some of these um, scholars have really influenced um, British um, black scholars in, in thinking about um, justice and technology. So it's really important to pick up the conversation as to how a monopoly 
um, on emerging technologies enforce white supremacy in everyday life. And American Black Studies professor uh, Ruha Benjamin carves out a space in her book, Race After Technology, to really remind us that the employment of new technologies that reflect and reproduce existing inequities, but that are promoted, and this links back to my first starting point in thinking about the films, uh, Hollywood films, they're promoted and perceived as more objective or progressive than the discriminatory systems of the previous era. So this is kind of, you know, pointed back to that thing about the Hollywood movies. And she asserts that invisibility with regard to whiteness, the kind of hiding behind um, a system, you know, almost like, you know, this system we, we've got, it's out of our control. We have nothing to do with it. This offers immunity and um, a lack of responsibility and accountability to be unmarked by race allows you to reap the benefits, but escape responsibility for your role in an unjust system. So a kind of classic example that she gives is around um, white sounding names and how with uh, algorithms now are kind of sorting through who gets to do a job and the value is ascribed in the data set to those names that sound um, essentially do not sound um, black. Um, and it allows racism to become amplified, automated beyond the apparatus control, and these technological fixes reinforce the status quo. So let's look very briefly, if we can, at some of the working definitions of artificial intelligence. So distinguishing between the different types, we talked about um, narrow AI or weak AI, machine learning essentially, performing a single task, pulling in information from data sets, making data-driven decisions. Um, it's not conscious or sentient in any way, and it has no way of being close to human-like intelligence. It completes tasks faster than humans and is aimed at increasing um, efficiency. Then we have general AI or strong AI, which doesn't exist yet. And we're thinking about reasoning, problem solving, making judgments, um, uh, becoming innovative and imaginative and creative, um, and could perhaps be, become capable of being conscious. And then super AI, which is um, having an intellect that exceeds the human cognitive performance in most is a domains of interest. And it's all humans, 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 humans. Um, so you can see that we have this history of kind of thinking about a particular species and a species hierarchy that's focused um, on some of us. And um, it's really important that the, the German scholar and artist Hitto Serla reminds us of the histories of technology in considering art in the age of planetary civil war. So apparently the way that into the museum or even into history itself, it's not a one way street. Is the museum a garage, an arsenal, is a monument um, pedestal, a military base? So kind of thinking about where the origins of those technologies have kind of come from. And in her series of artworks at Serpentine Gallery in London, she can considered ideas of power um, power, uh, and that power is the necessary condition for any digital technology. With and with, she had multiple meanings in the work um, with the word power, from thinking about electrical currents to the ecological powers of plants and the complex networks of authority that shape our environments. And so using her artwork to kind of portray these um, ways of thinking about um, the challenge of technology and power and where it's coming from. Um, one aspect, I think, and, and this was touched on already, um, that we just cannot ignore is the incredible amount of power that machine learning and smart devices now consume. And there's a great book, it's quite a slim volume um, that gives you a, a flavor of this, Is AI Good for the Planet by Bernadette um, Bravini. Um, so on the one side, there's the opportunity to consider other forms of intelligence. And in one of our works, Nature Switch, um, we're thinking about what plants know and how they um, sense outside of human registers to start thinking about coexistence and how we live together more equitably with, with other um, species and to disrupt these species hierarchies. Um, but how do we also consider the moment that we're in right now and how we move forward from it? And I would say, you know, um, Angela Davis would say, you know, this is a moment of possibility. We can go off in different trajectories. We don't have to go along um, the, the path of the past, which continues us in a particular trajectory, which upholds um, whiteness and everything that comes with whiteness. So I want to leap back into kind of anti-colonial movements and to speak to really a role for the independent um, art scene very quickly. So um, this painting by uh, Wadsworth Jarrell a sculptor and printmaker was one of, he was one of the original five founders of the US Black Arts Collective, Afri Krober, 
um, in mid 60s Chicago, where he lived and saw this, you know, ra racial uprising, violence and black empowerment by local artists and organizers. And this led to the organization of a black American um, culture, a group that served as a launching pad for the black arts movement and a focus really, if you look at the colors in black joy, but also messaging around what to buy, to, who to stop buying from, which really was a position of solidarity with black social movements of the time. Um, and then we could skip back to Turner um, in 1840 and the abolitionist movement in the late 18th and 19th centuries. Um, so this, the Zong massacre was a mass killing of um, more than 130 African enslaved people by the crew of the British slaver ship Zong um, when they um, realized that slavery was gonna be abolished and they wanted to claim for the losses of their slaves they threw them into the sea and the, the, um, this, the slaves um, drowned. And Turner makes a painting of the slave ship as a representation of the, the massacre to present it in, in, in kind of historical memory. And the ship, of course, is a technology. And we can think about um, what it's been used for and what it was brought about to do. And I hope that we can keep bringing that into question and into conversation. Um, in thinking about the climate crisis, um, you know, Ben Oakry says the response to our most urgent threat requires new forms and, of creativity and human imagination. Um, he calls on a, an existential creativity to find a new art to waken both to the enormity of what is looming and the fact that we can still do something about it. I, I picked Ben Oakry, of course, because um, I have a uh, a Nigerian heritage and, and you know he really speaks to me in that sense um, and he says that this is a time when we ought to really dedicate ourselves to bringing about the greatest shift in human, human consciousness and in the way that we live so just very briefly to close um, there's a project that I'm working on at the moment it's a research project which is looking at cultures of um, the use of machine learning in a range of settings with drug discovery higher education and arts practice. And I lead on the arts practice case. Um, so this is with Sheffield University and Dr. Joe Bates, who came up with this brilliant idea to look at different cultures in which machine learning was being used and how um, practitioners' beliefs, values, and feelings were interacting with how they engage with um, and in data mining with narrow AI, so you know machine learning. Um, so we've been looking at, and we're about to start um, looking at how artists are using machine learning across a range of art forms and combinations of art forms. And so we're really interested in the work that you're doing. And we're really interested to bring um, practitioners um, into conversation with one another about the, the work um, that they're creating and the, um, their, their feelings and interactions with it and the values that underpin that making of that work. There'll be an artist residency in early 2023. So do look out for that um, to engage with the findings and critique us and challenge us in how we're thinking about that and bringing it back into um, the public sphere and thinking about um, the, the culture of research, I guess, and how to bring um, research findings to life. So we're currently recruiting artists, curators and commissioners to take part in the study. Um, the postdoctoral doctor researchers um, working on the arts case of Monica Fratkovitz, uh, um, Itzel Medina Perea, and um, um, the, the link to the work, um, which is unfolding gradually um, um, as we speak. The thing I wanted to finish on was the, the problem of not net zero and how it kind of links to this challenge of a, an aesthetic, a, a way that um, Western cultures look at the world and that we focus in this equation in, in, in in, in considering a fundamental principle of life where we're all dependent on solar energy and the production of oxygen and, um, and, and sugar from, from plants. Um, we are absolutely focused on the left-hand side of the equation and bringing down CO2, carbon dioxide, without really thinking about the broader perspectives and the life and liveliness of our of biodiversity and, and plants and, and all kinds of other non-human species that create the possibility um, for um, life on Earth. And so the problem of not zero, in ze again, it's a data thing, and zeroing in on um, an element, we exclude everything else from our thinking. And so I'm really interested in how we critique this problem of net zero and, of course, who will be impacted in the way that the West mitigates uh, and, and moves towards net zero 
and the economies that will be disrupted around the world as a result of that. Um, there is an arts um, opportunity that's out for tender that anyone's interested that I'll put in the chat, um, but I'll close with that um, thinking around problems of elements and thinking about life and liveliness and the role of really the need for an independent art scene to, to work with these technologies, break these technologies. And as Ruha Benjamin said, we need to dismantle them and, and, and rethink how we want to engage with technology um, to create the futures that we want. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Erin Ma. Urvashi, would you like to join us? Um, we will now proceed into a, a fireside chat between um, Urvashi and Erin Ma to further unpack what we brought up just now. So yeah, if either of you have any questions or uh, comments for each other, we could. Um, I mean, I guess I think it was really good to highlight um, the labor perspective um, and to hear a bit more about the, the Indian context um, around um, thinking about that on the one hand and then the possibility of innovation. So how do we kind of move from the challenge of, of the labor issue towards the space for innovation? Yeah, that's such a such a good question and something that we've also been grappling with. I mean, so just maybe just to give a little bit more context on the Indian, uh, or to give some more flavor to the Indian context, and then and then maybe we can think a little bit about what how we move how we move into thinking about innovation processes. So so like I was saying earlier, so there is a big narrative in the Indian context that because we are um, we have a very large population and there's been a fair amount of digitalization and the cost of data is pretty cheap uh, compared to most other work places we are a data rich country um, and that there is an and this is the policy level this is the policy level framing and because we're a data rich country as a data rich country that gives us an opportunity to turn that data richness into um into a means of individual empowerment and addressing socioeconomic challenges and development challenges. So it's really about kind of the availability of all this data makes us, creates an opportunity for data empowerment. I mean, there's a number of issues with, with this kind of narrative, right? I mean, I think, um, and and that's perhaps a se separate conversation but the the most obvious one which is i think just worth highlight oh the issue that's worth highlighting is obviously it reflects also a kind of retrenchment of the state and its responsibilities towards addressing many of these problems which are structural uh, which are systemic um, and certainly beyond the capacity of individuals and certainly marginalized individuals to be able to address. So it's really a very kind of neoliberal retrenchment of the state and saying that you have data, you're rich, go figure, right? That's that's the kind of policy vision right now around, and, and therefore building AI solutions is seen as crucial, right? Because that's the way that we can leverage uh, AI. And then there's also this narrative that, you know, India has missed the boat on previous industrial revolutions, and we can't miss the boat on the fourth industrial revolution, right, because we are data rich. Um, but so that's the kind of like policy narrative and what we how we see that translating into real world impacts or uh, policy outputs is that there's a lot of emphasis on creating open data. And openness is seen almost as the new silver bullet to addressing many of the challenges we see in the kind of tech ecosystem. But, and, and I can see Erin Ma also nodding, I mean, openness is not so simple, right? I mean, openness can also result in the reproduction of power, asymmetry, so on and so forth. So that, that's the kind of government's view on it, like just open it up and then let the market do its magic and voila, we will have amazing social development outcomes. The, 
the the reality is quite different from what's happening on the ground. So despite this narrative of India being kind of data rich, digitalization, public sector data, so on and so forth, it's actually the way people use the way people use the internet is very limited. Uh, is very functional oriented. Uh, people have shared devices. Uh, people use community uh, hardware. Uh, people have restrictions on how they use it, so on and so forth. So, and and public data that is available is just not very good. It's 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 very patchy. It's fragmented. It has many gaps, so on and so forth. So, this whole idea that this data is just available for us to build AI, and all we need to do is like make it more available. Uh, to tech companies is 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 flawed. It doesn't match the reality on the ground. So what you have happening on the ground is that you have kind of startups who are then collecting data from scratch, right, to build build or test out various kind of AI based products in healthcare and agriculture, so on and so forth. And that's where the labor comes in. So they're reliant entirely on these civil society networks and community workers because they're the ones who have connections with the community. Uh, those workers are not paid and, and what we'd already discussed. But I think what's interesting here and, and to, come to, to come more directly to your question is that it also suggests that in many ways we are actually at a point of digitalization like we are actually digitalizing we're not there isn't just the data just lying there waiting to be captured and waiting to be leveraged or waiting to be unleashed right like we're in the process of actually building digital data and so there do we have an opportunity to not just have this mass datafication of everything and then hope for the best, but really think about it more intentionally, more deliberately, and put people at, and put communities at the heart of that, rather than um, what, what we're seeing currently, right, where they're just mere kind of data collectors. So I think there is an opportunity. The, the interesting kind of flip that I see at a policy level, and sorry, I keep talking about policy, but it's what I, I guess work in. So that's that's where I naturally kind of gravitate to. But what you see the flip on the, on the policy level to that conversation is that, okay, here's an amazing employment opportunity. Let's address this problem by just giving them money right but that's that's not really um i mean it doesn't address any of the deeper kind of structural issues we're talking about whether it's about how do you really build more participatory and emancipatory kind of technology or even like how do we think about changing work cultures so there is a recognition of the work that is happening of the labor that is happening but that is being seen as an opportunity for employment creation without any conversation about what that employment means what the value of it is is it regenerative i think someone had Post that question, or is it just like extractive and transactional? Um, so there is there is an opportunity, but I feel like there's not enough work being done on how to kind of, you know, widen that opportunity space. Yeah, I really hear what you're saying there. I wonder if there's um something in 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 kind of lending from um, the intelligence of an indigenous culture in thinking about land and uh, sovereignty so think about data sovereignty and how um, that ownership sits with the community so when you're talking about the community um, owned spaces and and what that what that data is used for the power that kind of comes from from a community owned um, perspective yeah I mean it's so interesting that I mean, I find again, and what I see in the Indian context is that these conversations about data sovereignty are being hijacked um, by the state. Um, and so even kind of earlier, so in a response to kind of big tech and big tech monopolies, there was a kind of policy conversation around putting communities at the heart of innovation, data trust models, data cooperative models, and really a push for kind of community. But that community conversation has now become re been replaced by the state. So there's an appropriation of that sovereignty conversation again for, um, for, for state purposes. And, and that maybe also leads me to a question I had for you or, or something that came up when I was listening to your presentation. So what, what really strikes me these days about kind of these new, like, um, um, gosh, what are they called? Um, Discord and uh, gosh, I can't remember. I'm, what is the latest one? Um, 
do you know what I mean, right? Like um, the new kind of AI clubhouse. What is the one with M? Um, Mid journey, mid journey. Thanks, Morgan. Um, is like I I don't have an account, but my husband has one, and I've been seeing what's happening in the Indian context, and there's a lot of kind of very techno nationalist kind of imagery that I see emerging in these spaces, and I find that really interesting because it's not like the Tom Cruise, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Elon Musk. There is a kind of pushback, in some sense, to that, and there is a kind of different image that is appearing, but it continues to be like very masculine, very, uh, in this case, like techno-nationalist. So I, I was just wanted to throw that out there if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think I think it's really, um, one of the things I've been thinking about is, is uh, you know, whether it's Clubhouse or whether it's spaces on Twitter, um, these technologies exclude, completely exclude, um, uh, disabled people in the sense of, um, you know, captions. And so we're creating these, these technologies are being created. And I, I think with Twitter spaces, at some point, some a technologist decided to put in, decided to put in captions, which meant that deaf people could access, access it and people that needed to have captions. Um, but other people complained, <laughs> the users complained. And so off went off went the captions. So that kind of that, that market logic that comes with oh you know the consumer's right. Well, actually, you know, for me, it's really about how do you really look to the to the margins, because that's where the innovation comes, and and so that requires a different way for the technologists to think about who they're engaging with, but also which which technologists are invited to the table in the first place. And I if I was to think about from a disability perspective. Um, the hacking that has to come with being a disabled person in society to constantly innovate, to navigate the hostile environment that's been created by our ableist society, you know, um, that's inventiveness. And that inventiveness needs to be built into our cultures of, of technology making, but also of art, of, of, of making art. Um, so yeah, I'm really interested in, in, in thinking about those perspectives that are missing and one of the things that came out of our racial justice fellowship which was a really nice thing actually we had really great solidarity between um, the intersections of uh, racial justice disability studies queer perspectives um, which allowed us to create a space in which um, one we could be our authentic selves and two we could find these solidarities across those social identities to really consider an anti-oppressive perspective um, and so that was a really positive thing to try and create these spaces in which we build solidarities between um, minoritized social identities, because from there you can start to begin. OK, so what do we want? Where are we going? How do we um, how do we move forward and how do we make things different from what they were? And that allowed us to adopt a series of principles where we thought about access as part of practice and that that would be built into all of our sessions. And, you know, I'm really trying to make sure that I take that forward in, in, in what I do going forward. Um, you know, I, it, the change, I think, starts with ourselves. And so in the work that we're going to be doing um, with patterns and practice and working with practitioners um, is really recognizing that we need to have those conversations with creative technologists and practitioners and funders themselves, because there is this scent, the slipperiness and the invisible nature of, of, of um, technology and how it's built behind a closed door, um, there is this sense that, at, you know, there's no accountability and we can't do anything about it. And it's progressing beyond our concern, beyond our, our, you know, beyond what we would like it to. And actually, I don't prescribe to that. I'm, so I was really interested to work with um, artists and entre cultural entrepreneurs. Um, I can see Maya Chowdhury is one person who's in the audience. Um, who were, you know, wanting to work with these technologies, but to think about them in a more critical way in terms of how they make their art, or in terms of the the social the services that they're providing, and um, and and how they they consider those to be um, considering both the environment, but also about not doing harm to particular minoritized um, audiences and groups. And so I think that that's something that that's really important is how we open up these spaces in which different people have the opportunity to do their research, reflect on 
the cultures of technologies bring their values and beliefs to the table. Yeah, to have to start having those um, those opportunities, and that means investing in difference. And if we look at you know whether it's in the independent art scene, even there, how do we generate bodies of work where in, we're investing in difference, so that we have to really critique where the money comes from. Um, if we look, this is a really lateral thought, but in Scotland very recently, two independent cinemas closed down. And of course, cinemas are kind of cultural hubs. And those cinemas have, have closed down because although they were presenting independent film, they didn't have an independent business model. And so the system that was propping it up ceased trading and everything collapsed. So we really have to think in the kind of cultural sector how we build a different kind of power structure for what we're doing in terms of what earning money, commissioning, um, creating programs of work uh, that, that has this truly independent nature, uh, which is really challenging. But I think I'll take it back to that, that equation of energy and sunlight and oxygen and, and creating life and thinking about that is how do we... Um, if the energy crisis is something that's going to knock, knock some forms of culture out of play, how do we really invest in ourselves and in one another to keep things going? And that requires really thinking differently about cultural business models that has community resilience embedded in it. So I'm really interested in that. Oh, someone's mentioned about strange that neither of you have used the word Capitalism. I mean, so so I would say cap, I've, I've talked about white supremacy, of which capitalism is a system of oppression that stems from white supremacy. So for me, the white supremacy is linked to capitalism um, and is I'd rather go to the source, which is white was white supremacy. And capitalism is a way in which to enable um, that upholding of, of a particular lives and which lives matter. I think I've made that clear in the beginning. We could we can go into the, the, the nitty and the gritty, but of course it's capitalism. And, and now I'm talking about a different form of, um, of uh, making life possible that goes beyond capitalism. I think we've moved on a bit from the, the conversation about capitalism. So yes, we've named capitalism white supremacy actually um, which forms of life do we need to um, value? Yes, with that, it would be great if we could open the floor to more audience questions. So if anyone has a question, please feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand using the raise hand function and um, we can take questions. We, I see some questions in the chat. Tiz, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? Uh, yeah, hi. How are you guys doing? Um, I arrived a little bit late, so I don't know um, if if you guys talked about this a little bit. But uh, I I think I I said two things in the chat. The first one is about how fast technology evolves, and in my opinion, is much faster than we can evolve as a society and even as individuals. Uh, so I think that that has caused some problems for us, like, for example, us not being able to, in a way, it, you know, what happens in social media. There's many things that uh, occur from time to time that it's only uh, visible on hindsight because we don't know what we're dealing with. And I think uh, these new technologies, blockchain, uh, the cryptocurrencies are a perfect example of that. Of, of how we don't really truly understand what we're creating and, and in terms of AI, we, we don't really know what, like how AI is achieving certain conclusions. We just know uh, what they did at the end. Uh, so it's very difficult to kind of understand what AI is doing on its own. So I, I was wondering like if we were to, to sort some of the problems when we're talking about uh, climate change, uh, if we would be ourselves able to adapt to the changes and, and, and whatever is required to, to create a new lifestyle, you know, because in my opinion, it's gonna require, of course, a lot of sacrifice. We cannot consume as much as we consume now. And the energy consumption, we really need to think about that as well. 
because it's a lot and I don't think we can really uh, offset that too much. Um, so yeah, that was one of the of, of the thoughts that I have and saying like how we as humans, because we are, are more faulty than that and we're more complicated than that and, and we have different cultures, different ways of seeing the world, how, how can we manage uh, in such a global project that this is. Um, and just talking about the other one, when we're talking about it, like the indigenous groups or different cultures that are not hegemonic and using these technologies and trying to create things with these technologies that are purposeful for these cultures. And I question if it's how, how um, useful are these technologies for, the, for this if they are themselves created by an hegemonic culture. Uh, the programming languages, most of them are based in English. So how can you even think differently if language is the way you think? Uh, I don't know if this is too complicated because uh, yeah, uh, it might be better explained in the text that I wrote. No, thank you for bringing this um, into the, the conversation. Um, if I take the bit about the non-hegemonic cultures first, I mean, this is the thing about, in, you know, if we're to think about language and what I think why the arts is such an important space for this to be investigated is that possibility of using different languages that is one, not, not necessarily spoken, two, not necessarily in English. And so the possibility of, of um, a particular culture that's not a hegemonic culture to work with um, the idea of what an algorithm might be and what people would like to do with that, which for some people is about, you know, fostering collaboration, building community, um, dismantling systems of power elsewhere, starting to use some of these technologies to, um, to support the way in which um, you can almost forensically point out where harms are being done to your environment. So thinking about how um, some indigenous people are starting to embrace the use of, of drones um, to, to, to look at some of the challenges in their environments and to point out, look, here's some things that are happening that are not, that are not good. Um, so on the one hand, dismantling and using those technologies kind of against the hegemonic culture to point out some of the harms, but and also on the other to kind of build the possibilities for community and community building. And I think, you know, one of the challenges with um, where we are right now is with the biodiversity crisis is that we don't, because of the way that Western science has almost gone through the whole of um, our, our policy, um, the big challenge is that people aren't thinking about how all of these things are interlinked, right? And how our lives are dependent on on other species and, and other ways of living and that we have to also introduce anti-oppression. So I can only talk about how I'm doing it. And one of those things has been in my work with environmental scientists is that we've introduced anti-oppression to really understand the systems of power behind science that we have orchestrated from the West in order then to think about how do we come together as a community of practice that wants to make a difference. And so thinking locally, recognizing the kind of global, the harm of, of the global, and that with the global comes trading and kind of all the challenges that comes with trading and the footprints of that, how do we then as a community build out from that ourselves? And so I can't speak for others, but that's one way in which we've been trying to think about it. And on the, um, the project where we're looking at cultures of machine learning and practitioners, rather than saying, oh, all technology is bad and the technologists are bad and they don't know what they're doing, let's have a discussion, a conversation about the beliefs and values that underpin the technologies and the choices that you're making. Um, and, and that requires building trust with some of these companies to get inside of them and to kind of work with them and to say, well, you know, then people can start thinking, okay, what could we do differently? So kind of working with the ecosystem as well as working on ourselves. And then hoping that the arts is a space in which a lot of these rules can be broken, rethought, reshaped, 
um, you know, really interested to see what artists um, want to do with these technologies um, that are not some of the things that these companies are doing. Now that I'm thinking uh, your what you said uh, sparked an idea of saying, what if if it's possible to create a programming language that is not based on on any of the languages that exist, but or or that we have like defined, but maybe undefined languages like art, as you said, or yeah, maybe I don't know, maybe music. It would be interesting to to think like that and see what that would do. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree with you. There's not much to do but to to point out and 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 try to make things better and and more inclusive in that way. Thank you so much for your Thank questions. You. Well, I'm just okay. gonna let my cat out of the door. <laughs> I've closed the window, which means he has no escape route. One second. No worries. Karen, would, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question or would you like us to read it out? Uh, yeah, well, I think uh, one question was already discussed a little, but the other one, uh, yeah, I was just so suddenly occurred to me the difference between this term artificial intelligence and, and particularly that word intelligence, which is so grating on me as as an educationist you know someone who has you know rebelled against the whole idea of intelligence and then you know maybe this other term machine learning is actually quite different and and um you know would be a better term and a better thing to work towards yeah maybe i can come in on that question or point that you raised Karen um yeah I think I think it it really does raise questions about what kind of intelligence is being coded into these systems what kind of intelligence we privilege um and I think if you speak to a number of kind of leading computer scientists who are at the cutting edge of AI research many of them would tell you or most of them I think would tell you that it's it's not actually the AI spring, like as is often portrayed in the media or in kind of investor circles, that in fact, this is like a great AI nap because the kind of intelligence that is being, um, that is built into kind of machine learning systems is actually not how humans work at all. Uh, this is not how we understand, this is not how we acquire information. So you might have heard often this analogy being used when you're talking about machine learning and training the algorithm about it being like a child, like you train your algorithm like you train a child and you expose the algorithm to so many more things and the child and the algorithm learns just like a child learns, but actually children don't learn that. that. Children don't need to see 10,000 cats to recognize what a cat is, right? They're able to kind of figure out a cat much quicker than that without having to see those 10,000 cats. So the, the kind of intelligence that is, is being uh, privileged in these, in these models is actually, it's, it's just, you know, it's very advanced computational statistics. Um, and if we go back and we, you know, read our old methods textbooks on the limitations of statistics, it's not very very new those limitations so we do need to kind of push I think and think about other types of intelligence um, there's some you know what what would it look like if we didn't work with big data and we work with small data uh, what it would it look like if we didn't work with the data that was discrete in kind of discrete entities but was instead warmer and fuzzier around around the edges. So I think even that, that question of what constitutes data and what constitutes legitimate data privileges a particular way of knowing and seeing the world. So what are the other ways of knowing and seeing uh, and what would then data look like? And then what would intelligence look like? like? And I think like the arts is a great place to explore those kind of questions. And like the boring policy worlds that I, I normally uh, find myself in, these kind of questions, there's no patience, patience for um, because it's so kind of goal oriented and outcome or efficiency oriented but um, I think the arts is a great place to explore these further and to work with technologists to explore these further. 
Thank you so much for that, Urvashi. Karen, I hope that answers your question. Uh, Tini had a question for Erin Ma uh, about the net zero. Tini, would you like to? Yes, I, I missed this point. Hello, everybody. I, I, uh, I saw the, the, the formula, but I didn't exactly understood. I understood it on the surface, but could you please uh, explain it again? Yeah, sure. And, and it's kind of really, um, so if we're thinking about, and, and this comes really from Western thought and the way in which we have framed the problem of the climate crisis and that it's about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we're very focused on bringing down carbon dioxide in the atmosphere without thinking about the other end of the equation, which is um, that other plants in relation to light are producing oxygen and we need that process, which is a, you know, it's a, it's a process, it's a relationship between solar, between the sun, the plants, um, things that breathe, and then things that um, put out um, oxygen. And so that those, those processes are completely simplified into thinking just about carbon dioxide. And so, and, and what that does is it allows um, investors to say, to, to, to create an economy around carbon dioxide and carbon, you know, carbon futures. So I want to say, that how do we get beyond thinking about carbon? Because carbon actually is just part of this long history of um, white supremacy and capitalism and extractivism. Um, and so in just thinking about carbon, and not thinking about flourishing biodiversity and other species, actually we're creating a future in which particular forms of technology dominate. And a lot of those technologies will be potentially, you know, things to, to, to get carbon out of the atmosphere. People are not calculating that, you know, some of these are computing solutions. They're not calculating in the future how much carbon dioxide that goes on to put in, in the atmosphere off in the future, but also, um, for example, where some of these um, data storages exist around the world. And they're, they're often positioned in places that white people don't want to live or in indigenous populations or in Arctic um, areas. And they're degrading the environment as quickly as we can take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So it's a kind of this double-edged sword which is a, it's a, it's a, almost like a magic trick to go, let's focus on this and then we can build an economy around it without thinking who are the people that benefit or don't benefit from that and actually who is harmed. So if we, if, if in the West we do the mitigation and we take all the investments, you know, someone will pay for that and it won't be the people who've done the harm. Other, you know, government, other people will pay for it. Uh, and then the people that really have done have had no input on the carbon levels in our atmosphere um no one's paying for them to mitigate and then there'll be this focus on oh hang on you're not doing it so the cost of it actually unpicks the very lives of those who've been exposed to the challenges of the climate and the biodiversity crisis and is an offset of how we create or move or transition to a different future so essentially what it's doing is bringing old histories into the future by creating a capitalist economy around um, carbon and carbon dioxide, if that makes sense. When we're, we're just looking at this one focus, forgetting about all of the other elements that are, are part of it and all the other species that are part of it and those most affected by the climate crisis. So net, net zero, as imagined in the West, could end up doing a lot more harm in other parts of the world in the global South um, where there's a global majority that are going to be affected by the climate crisis. And so I'm really keen that we critique that and consider how we transition um, to ways of living, ways of working that supports all life, not just those of us who are living in the West. Thank you very much. <laughs> you see what I mean? Thank you. Thank you so much. We'd like to invite Kamya and Irini to close the session.
Thank you so much, first of all, Urvasi and Irinma, for your brilliant uh, and insightful presentations. And there's so much food for thought there. And uh, I can, I mean, we could we could go on with this conversation for much, much longer. <laughs> I, I had I had a few questions as well, but I just I didn't want to, I wanted to give priority to other people. But hopefully, we will have a chance to 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 come back and and discuss more. And also, I just wanted to say a big thank you to everyone who has been here and for your super interesting questions and conversation. And uh, yeah, and of course, like uh, Kamia, I don't know if you want to say our dates for the next dialogue uh, yet, or if uh, we just, yeah, we will just announce this. Not on the top so of my head, early. but I think it's 10th <laughs> of November. For everybody who's in the room, it's the 10th of November. We're talking about body, body politics, and machines. So another super relevant conversation. Uh, but really, uh, we try really hard to bring fabulous speakers like Erinma and Urvashi to really unpack this world that we are all braving together in a way. Um, so kind of pulling together practices that are thinking through complex conversations like climate on the one hand and AI on the other is not an easy task, especially when we put those two things together. So experts like uh, the amazing speakers today really help us ground some of our practices in critical conversations. So once again, on, on behalf of all of us, Erinma and Urvashi, Thanks for being absolutely stimulating with uh, what you had to say here. One and a half hours is too little a time for this deep. Uh, I mean, you just really opened up how deeply one needs to think while we do what we do. Um, but hopefully we can kind of revisit this conversation. For folks in the room, this will be online. So please revisit this conversation. There was so much to bite off and chew and digest as we go forward and uh, yeah and so we'll try to share this with as many people as we can as well from our websites and just so to thanks pick up once on, again there was and... one point from karen haydock which i just want to pick up on and to say you know absolutely solidarity across race and class and gender and non-human solidarity all the way to the future yeah. absolutely thank you Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you both. Bye, everybody. Stay in touch.